All you have to know is that Jesus is a healer. All you have to know is that he's compassionate. Bless God, he comes by and he picks you up out of the dirt, out of the pain of your life, and he lifts you up on solid ground. He said, look, I love you. I care about you. I'm the healer. I'm your blesser. I'm your savior. I am the one you've been looking for. Trinity Gospel Temple presents Brother Dave and the Hour of Power Singers. Hello, everybody. The Lord bless you real good. So good to be with you today. I appreciate you tuning in to Brother Dave and the Hour of Power Singers telecast as a part of your family devotion. And we're going to have a great time today. I have a message that God's laid upon my heart. I'll be ministering in a few moments. So stay tuned and let's enjoy the service together. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. We welcome you into this house today. Lord, we give you everything we have today. All our praise, all our heart. Hallelujah. We want to come together and worship you as one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. We want to come together today. Jesus, he comes moving up slowly. He's got eyes of fire. He's so holy, holy. He says, I know you, you know me. One thing I can tell you is you've got to be free. Come together right now over me. Shine. He's got feet that's glowing. He's got lightning flashes. He's all wisdom and knowing. He says one and one and one and three. Want to see the Father? Then you'll look straight at me. Come together. Final attraction, he's got all we wanted, he's a satisfaction, he's got power like we never seen. He says, Come into my arms so I can heal your disease. Come together.
Here's my deduction He's a final attraction He's got all he wanted He's a satisfaction He's got power like we never seen Come into my arms so I can heal your disease Come together Amen, amen. Yes. Come on, Consuela. Need your help on this one. <laughs> We just welcome you. Let your glory fall on us today. Be in this place with us today, Lord, in a powerful way. Have your way. The splendor.
Come on, would you give him an ovation of praise? Glory to your name today, Lord. Worthy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is the Lord. Blessed be your name forevermore. Hallelujah. Well, he's here today, and we're going to pray for some folks around the country. If you would, would you turn your eyes towards the uh, cameras in the back? And we're going to extend our hands towards those who are watching today. We're going to believe for, for the, the Lord to just touch people right there in your home today. I don't know what your need is, but he knows what your need is today. So, Father, today we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We invoke the blessing, the benediction of heaven today. Father, we lift up our nation today from border to border, from coast to coast. We lift up our president, Father God. We pray that you would give him wisdom, wisdom to know how to deal with the issues that we're facing in our nation today, economic issues, uh, protection issues, Father God, issues that deal with drugs and all kinds of things that we've have to, we have to face off with every day. Father, we ask for wisdom for our president, wisdom for our Congress, Father God. We pray that you'd bring our nation together in unity today, Father God, that we can get accomplished what you want to get accomplished for our nation. Father, we're believing that today. We lift up our Supreme Court, our, our justices today. Father God, Supreme Court justices, let your kingdom come, your will be done in their lives. Let your hand rest upon them. Give them great wisdom as they adjudicate. We lift up our governor of the state of Ohio today, Father God, Governor DeWine. Pray that you would just, just put your hand upon him in this new administration, all those who work with him, all the way down to our local level, our, our, our mayors and all of, all of those. And Father, those who are watching today in other states, we lift up the, 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 the glory of God to just flow in your state right now. We believe that lives will be touched, bodies healed, Satan stopped, souls saved, Father God. We're believing for many, many souls today. We lift up our partners who who uh, sow into this ministry. Father God, those who have given and sown, Father God, our truck drivers, Father, who are just uh, traveling across the, the nation from the highways to the byways, Father God, those ministers, Father God, who are out there just sharing the gospel with people in truck stops and places all over. We lift up those bikers who are, are carrying your name and the banner for the Lord Jesus Christ. We lift up Christian bikers across this country. Pray you would protect them, watch over them, Keep them in the palm of your hand today, Father God. We lift up our, our uh, friends on the reservations, our Native Americans, Father God. Pray that you would just touch their lives, Father God. We come against the spirit of oppression and depression in this nation. Father, we lift up those who are dealing with opiate addictions. Father, I just know there are people right here in this room that have family members and friends they know of that are dealing with addictions of all different types. We're believing for your miracle, Father God, to flow. Father, we just lift up in Chicago those families who lost loved ones in the recent attack there, Father God, in Aurora. Father, we just ask that you would just, Father God, heal this nation of the anger, the animosity, the violence, Father God. We speak peace to this nation from border to border, from coast to coast, nation to nation. Father God, state to state, island to island. We're believing for a mighty, mighty outpouring of your spirit. And we believe for a great awakening, Lord. A great awakening of your spirit, Father God. A return to your word. Father God, that people would study your word. That your word would become alive and well in every single one of us, Father God. That we would love your word. And that we would put it in our hearts and hide it in our hearts today. So Lord, we lift up this service and we pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon us. And that everything you want to accomplish for this service from the foundations of the world, that it would be accomplished. So I lift up our partners and declare his kingdom come, his will be done in your life today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord an ovation of praise. Thank you, Lord, for your soft, loving touch. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power. Take me back to the outer court, the holy place. Praise, hunger and 
God. It's always good to be together in the house of God. I'm so glad you're here. I'd like you to join me as uh, we read a scripture to preface our message today. It's in Matthew, the 16th chapter, the 13th to the 19th verse. Now, we're going to read this as our text, but later on I'm going to come back to it and spend more time on it. But let's read together, please. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? This is very interesting. So they said, Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said a very interesting, penetrating question. He says, But who do you say that I am? Now notice, of course, Simon Peter always was one who could blurt out. He was very bombastic. He says, he answered, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered a very pertinent answer to him. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. We pray that you'll anoint me to preach the word and also for all of us to have the anointing of God to receive the word. We pray that good will come out of it. Holy Spirit, we ask you to allow your gifts to be in operation as we minister. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the Son of the living God, we pray. Amen. You know, the greatest transcendent categorical challenge to human logic in the world is the incarnation of Christ. It's the most difficult to understand and humanly and logically to analyze. And so it is the incarnation of Christ that gets our attention today as evangelicals. Exasperating the dilemma is the fact that this is the solitary time in history that someone has been born of a virgin without the aid of a human father. And that's what makes it difficult for some to accept. Because God has never done this before, without precedence, the human mind, devoid of divine revelation, cannot understand this truth. We are the most privileged as his children to be enlightened to believe this truth and to understand it. It is a spiritual revelation. Let's go back to our text again. Remember, we were reading it. Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they begin to answer. And some thought it was John the Baptist and Jeremiah and so on. And then he asks that penetrating question. He says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter blurted it out right away. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus made it very clear. Now, this has been misunderstood by some in Christendom, but it's very clear if you look at it in the Greek. When Peter said that, Jesus answered him, said, Peter, and the, the Greek word for Peter here is, is Petra. But he said, Upon this rock, Petros, I build my church. In other words, Peter, it's not on you, but it's on the revelation that my Father has given you. Upon that rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's a mystery if we don't understand what the Scriptures teach. One thing I want to say to you, I read it to your onset of this message, is that we know about Adam and Eve, because I've talked about them many times, you know, remember that Adam was created as an innocent person, as was Eve when she was created. And they had a free moral agency. They could decide. They could choose. They, had the, they were creatures of choice. Now, they choose to do what they did, believe the devil in spite of Christ. And as a result, a great curse came upon the human race. But notice, as we talk about Christ, Christ is looked at as the second Adam. He came innocent as well, without sin, but he never committed a sin, and that's why he was, it was necessary for him to come. So we'll call him the new Adam. 
So it's comforting to know that the glorified man, Jesus, is presently in heaven interceding for us. Let's look at 1 Timothy 2 and 5 and see what Christ is about right now. It says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So Christ is now in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And who better to intercede for you than a mediator that came and lived as a human and yet is also the second person in the Trinity in heaven who would know the Father better than God himself. And so we have such a wonderful intercessor for us. He loves me in spite of my failings because he understands the struggle that we face. He's been there, done that. And that's why no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what the challenge has been to you, and I appreciate that some of you have gone through a very difficult time. Some of you have had loved ones who have committed suicide. And that's always almost impossible to put your arms around. And others of you have had loved ones who you love dearly, but got hooked on drugs or some kind of dope and, and they overdosed and, and you lost them. So it's very disheartening to lose people like that who prematurely die unnecessarily. And, and, and God understands. There are other kinds of things. You lose loved ones that you love, live with many, many years, and then for whatever reason, some one of them goes, you have to be by yourself. God understands that. Some of you are struggling financially, and you just can't hardly believe it, that you're going to be able to make it. But he understands because he was here as a human being so that he could relate to us in a way that an angel couldn't, Gabriel couldn't, and any of the great angels of heaven couldn't take the, the, do, take the, take the place that Jesus took. And so he loves us. We have dealt with the first two uh, reasons why the incarnation was an absolute necessity. One, he must be. Number one, of the seed of the woman. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. It's a very interesting portion of Scripture. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So it immediately begins to let us see the struggle that is going to happen in the world. And secondly, he says that he was to be the new Adam, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. Now watch, as I mentioned earlier, the first Adam failed. He, had a, he was a creature of choice, and he decided to believe the devil rather than Christ. That was a choice on his part. But notice the second Adam comes. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That shows us the godly part. Remember when we say Jesus became a God-man. The second person in the Trinity came to live in him. And so also those who are heavenly. And uh, that's a great portion of Scripture that opens the door to us to understand where we're at. Now, the third reason for the incarnation is the necessity for him to become our high priest. We need a high priest, not to just temporarily cover our sins or help us to find that uh, dilemma, that solution to the dilemma. But look at Hebrews chapter 2, 14 through 18, and let's look at who this second Adam has become. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is of the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And that's who we are. We are the seed of Abraham. Let's go on. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, like us, same feelings, same temptations, and that he might be merciful and faithful. That gave him the sympathy and the empathy for us. Faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that, he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to aid those who are tempted. And that's how we know that Christ has deep empathy and sympathy for us and can walk with us and understands where we're at. Now, our Lord was made like unto us in all areas, he was tested on human weakness. He was tested on every side. There was so much that came against him and that he might be able to identify with us. And when we are tempted, he can identify with our temptation. He could not do this if he did not partake of the human nature. And that's what we have to understand. Supernaturally, God caused the Holy Spirit to overshadow Mary and out of that came Jesus who was born because the seed was of God the Father. And that's why we call God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was born a total human being. But the second person in the Trinity was sent down at the same point and became amalgamated to that human flesh. So he became a God-man. But we know he laid aside his robes of divinity. He didn't operate in divinity. He lived as a human being as we did and do, and that's how he could understand and have empathy, as I've mentioned already. God cannot be tempted. In James 1, 13, let's read that. Let no man say that when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So the temptations have come as a result of the curse. And Jesus had endured those temptations as we do. That's how he relates to us. So if you remember when he went on the Mount of Temptation, the devil appeared to him. And remember, Jesus referred to the devil as the God of this world. And so when he appeared to Jesus, he began to make Jesus some stupendous off offered him some stupendous things that he would give to him if he would acknowledge Satan and acknowledge him as Lord or do what he had asked. And Jesus would say, you cannot tempt me. He went on to say, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so he was very strong about that. So that's how he could identify us when we struggle with temptation. Now, I'm sure that almost all of you would admit at some point in your life, and almost every day, but at least some point in your life, there have been temptations. Now, we often associate those only with the flesh and as it connects with sex or something else. But there are all kinds of temptations, all kinds of temptations to try aggrandize ourselves, make ourselves more than we are, or boast or lie and tell fibs just to build ourselves up and so on. And so we have that struggle every day, but we can say no to it because Jesus did, not only with flesh and body, but was made like unto us in all things, as the Bible tells us. He endured, endured the crucible of temptation. God knows many of you came out of good Christian homes and perhaps did not go through the same crucible that others who have lived off the street, so to speak, lived in broken homes where drugs were present, alcoholism was present. Perhaps one or, or no member of uh, the parent was in the home, maybe a single parent, grandparent raised you. There's all kinds of strange things that have happened. But he knows what you're going through because he was tempted in every kind of way possible. And he can secure us when we are tempted. Now, the Greek meaning for the word secure, S-U-C-C-O-R, to run to and of one who cries for help. When I'm in trouble, when I feel weak, 
when I'm burdened down or pressed out of measure, I can cry out, Jesus. How many times have you been forced into an emergency? Has this just out of nowhere, something happens. Notice as a believer, almost the first word out of your mouth is, Jesus, you cry out his name. And I can't tell you the myriad of times that I've seen the Lord take me through difficult times when it seemed impossible. Whether it was in a car under almost an almost accident, I never take them for granted. I say, Lord, thank you. Some way you aided me in this near tragedy. So when we cry out for help and we feel weak, he knows he was burdened down. He was pressed out of measure. And so when we cry out, Jesus, we're running to him, as it were, to be rescued because he feels what I am going through. Let me give you scripture for this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 this time, 14 through 16. Seeing then we have a great, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest, now watch this, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Why is that? Because he faced the same thing that you face, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, those scriptures are very clear so that you can say, Lord, you don't know what I'm good through. Oh, yes, he does. He does know what you're going through. Yes, I understand that it seems unique to you. Often I deal with someone and they'll say, Brother Dave, you can't possibly understand what I'm going through. No, I may not know that exact detail, but, you know, the Bible says it all. It's common among all men. There are, there, are, there are things that happen to all of us just because we're a human being subject to so many things. But Jesus can be touched, hallelujah, with the feeling of our infirmity. He sympathizes with us. Let's face it, when you're hurt or you're going through a difficult time or depressed or down a little bit, you know, you, you look for someone that can kind of lift you up a little bit. But many times we can't find anybody. Sometimes you try to tell somebody your tale of war, woe, and they'll say, you think that's something, and they'll tell you their woe, which is 10 times worse than yours. But when you go to Christ, he is sympathetic. He's touched with the feeling of our infirmity because he was subjected to every human condition and temptation and that you and I will ever know. So this is exclusive, exclusive experience. It allows Jesus to be faithful and merciful in his office as our high priest. The function of the high priest is to mediate for the sins and weaknesses of the people. That's the purpose of a savior. And that's what he specializes. He's our go-between. He's between you and the Father. And that's why you have such a wonderful connection with heaven. He stands between God and the people, between God and you, and he can plead our cause. Oh, I tell you, that's shouting ground. I give him the praise and the glory. Jesus became the mediator, notice the Bible says, of a better covenant. To God, there had been covenants throughout the Old Testament, but this was the best covenant, the better covenant. Let's go again back to Hebrews. I love Hebrews. Seventh chapter, verse number 22 first. By, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. He's the guarantee, a surety is the guarantee. And then let's go to Hebrews 12, 24. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. He's the one in between. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, let's go back to the eighth chapter. And now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, that which was established on better 
promises. So what has happened between us and God is unique to any time in history. When Christ came, he was the one that God sent from heaven so that he could intercede for you, so he could take you by the hand and join your hand with the Father's hand. And somehow by a supernatural miracle, he could join your hand with God's hand. And the Bible talks about reconciliation. And that's what happened when your hand, when his hand is in God's hand and it's in your hand and he puts it together and we are reconciled to God. Reconciled. That estrangement is past. Hallelujah. To his precious and holy name. His death as a lamb of God canceled our debt. I know it's hard to forget the past. And all of us have some sort of a past. Some of us have more of a checkered past than others. And so it's difficult because many people remind you of your past and so on. But as the sacrificial lamb, what his death accomplished for us was paying our debt. We could not pay it ourselves. He paid the debt. And his resurrected life as our mediator and high priest brings all of the benefits of God and saves us from any wrath to come. Now or ever. Again, back to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. I love Hebrews. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. <laughs> and someone said, to the guttermost. <laughs> those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There may be people that give up on you, and maybe there's someone that you've tried to get their forgiveness, and they just can't do it. They can't forget the past. But I can tell you one thing. Jesus is always on the job to listen to your confession and believe me, he'll not only listen to your confession, he will take it to heart and forgive you of your sins. And the Bible says those sins will be forgiven and forgotten as if they never happened in the first place. You can't find anybody on earth like that, but you can find somebody in heaven like that. His name is Jesus. It brings us all the benefits of God. It saves us from all the wrath to come or ever. So when the divinity of Christ was reactivated, now remember Jesus temporarily laid aside his divine regal robes of divinity. He, he became a God-man. It was there. He was part and parcel of the physical man, Jesus. But he laid it aside. But then there was a time when it was reactivated. The glory that was his from before the beginning was returned to him. And he resumed his position of power, of honor, and of authority. And is presently, ladies and gentlemen, seated at the right hand of the Father where he lives to make intercession for his brethren. Cons considers us his brethren. Now notice when Jesus died as a physical man, you couldn't die as God. God can never die. But he died as Jesus the man. And when he died, his spirit and soul, because if he was a human like us, he had a spirit and a soul. And in order to pay the ultimate price, that spirit and soul went to hell for us. And when he was wrecked, resurrected, his spirit and soul came out of hell, having become victorious over death, hell, and the grave went over to paradise where people who were believers from the Old Testament did the best they could, believed that the Messiah was to come. And he went over and he invited them to come out of that paradise so that they could go and be with him in heaven so that when someone dies now, they don't go down in the paradise, but they go up to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Praise be to God. So you can't, you can't compare this with anything else. So he, he is now both God and glorified man. Do you realize that when Jesus raised from the dead, his physical body had to be changed and quickened because he was the template for all Christians that we'd be changed and, and receive a glorified body, a glorified body that could never be sick again, that could never die again. And that's what he did. 
He is presently seated in heaven in his glorified human body. Now, he's a God-man, of course. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers, all of you that are partakers of this heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. He's the high priest of our confession. He's now both God and glorified man, and he's there in heaven. And he serves as the apostle of our faith. Apostle means one who is sent on a mission. And as man's representative to God, he is our high priest. He still maintains his human nature, making him able to understand our failures. Look at 1 John 1 and 9. You'll see what I mean. If we confess our sins, he, the glorified Christ in heaven, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful truth. He still maintains his human nature, making him able to understand. Our major qualification as a high, as one major qualification, I should say, of a high priest is to be able to sympathize with and to have compassion for the people that he represents. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Yes, there will be temptation as long as you're in human flesh. But he said that he'll never allow that temptation to become greater than you're able to handle. That doesn't mean that you will handle it properly. It just simply means that if you'll trust him, you'll be able to get through it. Will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So there's a wonderful song that I love from the past, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. It takes on no meaning in view of the incarnation. And there any wonder we love Jesus so much. It is not a fetish like, a, like Linus with his blanket. It's the knowledge that Jesus did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. He loved us when we were unlovable. And that's the ama amazing truth that we have to keep in mind. He loved us when we were unlovable. And I would like for you to take a few moments with me as we think about these matters. And I want you to pray with me because I do feel that many of you are hurting today and perhaps you've been so hurt spiritually. Someone has let you down and you're far from the place of having peace with God. You want to, you, you desire to find reality in Christ and you, you'd like to be able to forget, forget your past. You know, Paul makes a very simple statement in, in, in a third of uh, in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he said, here's how he handles it. He said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are past. He was able to forget those things. That's not easy. Now, you have to have the Lord help you to do that. The reason for that is psychologically, if you don't get rid of you don't forget your past or put it aside, it will forfeit your future because you'll just carry the baggage on with you throughout all of the years that you live. And that's why Paul, forgetting those things which are past, then he says, I reach forth unto those things which are before, and I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It just blesses my soul as I think about it. Let me just brag on Jesus just for a minute here. I want to tell you this, that the heavens of heavens can't contain him let alone some man explain him. You can't get him out of your mind and you can't get him off your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies together. They couldn't even get an agreement. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. I'm talking about King Jesus who rose up from the dead. And I'm going to pray for you and trust God that he meets the need of your life. Father, in Jesus' name, as I've already said, 
afore that there are people here that I know are in deep, deep trouble. There are people that are a part of our extended family, Lord, that are located throughout somewhere in the United States or perhaps somewhere around the world watching and a part of this ministry. Lord, I reach out to them, especially to those who have sin in their life and they've never fully confessed that sin to you and they've not fully believed that you could wash away that sin as far as the east is from the west. I pray that today will be their day of salvation. Others, Lord, that are physically impaired, they feel hopeless. They don't know which way to turn. Father, lay your hand upon them today. Reach down and lift them up. I speak peace into their life, into their heart, in Jesus' name. Heal the sick. Lord, there's so many things. People have heard bad news from the doctor. It may be their heart. It may have been a stroke or it may be some, some physical maiming of some sort. But Lord, you're able to do everything. And I ask you to heal the sick today. Minister to those who are elderly, Lord, who, who feel like they've just been left aside. But Lord, help them to know that they matter. Help them to know they matter. They're somebody. They matter. No one can fill their shoes. And I pray for them today. Lift them up in Jesus' precious name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I pray that miracles will happen in provision. I'll tell you one thing. Go through your life, believe in Christ. He is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Trust him today. I know he'll take you through every circumstance of your life. Praise his precious holy name. Brother Dave would be blessed to hear from you this week. Please call toll-free 877-453-2519 or locally 330-453-2519. Our address is tgtmail at trinitybrotherdave.org or Brother Dave, P.O. Box 20029, Canton, Ohio 44701. When you're in the Canton area, we invite you to visit Trinity Gospel Temple at 1612 West Tuscarawa Street, just off I-77. Or visit us online at www.trinitybrotherdave.org. I know you've been enjoying the message from God's Word. I always enjoy preaching it, but I always ask God not only to anoint me to preach, but to anoint you to receive the Word. You know, the Word of God is so invaluable to us. We need it to live our daily life. And I have a book that I've just recently written and just came off the press just a couple of months ago. And I believe this book can change your life. It's a series of messages that I gave some time ago, and it's called The Substance of Faith. All we ask, if you could give an offering of $15 or more, we'd be glad to send it to you. The Substance of Faith message here will help you learn how to live victoriously. It, it shows exactly how to use faith, what faith is, what the Bible says about it, and I'd like for you to have a copy. So write me this week. Just ask for The Substance of Faith or the Faith book would be sufficient. If you could send along a $15 offering or more and address your letter to me personally, it's on the screen, and I'll be glad to send you this book that I believe can change your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer because I know many of you have special needs in your life, and I, I want to pray for you. I just feel uh, a burden to pray for you. I know that some of you are having a tough time. Maybe you're immobile and have other physical maladies of one sort or another. God cares about you, and I care about you. And we're going to pray right now and trust God for a miracle, okay? Father, in the glorious and precious and holy name of Jesus, I pray for my many friends, Lord, that are a part of this ministry. I know it's nothing is accidental with you, Lord. We're, we're, we're doing exactly what we ought to do at the right time, at the right place. And I thank you for those, Lord, that are open to receive healing today. I speak peace and love and anointing into their life, every tissue, tendon, muscle, nerve, every organ of their body, to be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask for a miracle in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's it. Give God the thanks. I trust he's touched you today. Write to me this week. It's very important that I hear from you. 
hey, we've had a good time together. Remember something, you really don't have any trouble. All you really need is faith in God because faith in God moves mighty mountains. And another thing, the Lord has blessed us real good. Amen.